So, um, let's get into the Word. Finally, let's get into the Word, okay? We've come a long way with Peter. Remember, I was talking about Peter um, weeks, two months ago. And, and um, we looked at a lot of different parts of Peter's life. Um, his calling, his name change from Cephas to Peter. Um, his sinking, walking on the water and sinking and failing and falling. His confessing, thou art the Christ of the living God. Um, his cleansing when Jesus washed his feet and his regret and his guilt and his denial when he said, I don't even know this man. Peter, great character study for us because we are Peter. We all have some Peter in us. And Peter had a hard time shaking the old man. He had a hard time shaking the Cephas and becoming the Peter that Jesus wanted him to be. Now we come to a different Peter. Over the next uh, few weeks in the book of Acts, just three weeks, um, and, and uh, in the book of Acts, we run into an interesting thing in chapters 1 and 2, and it's, I see immediately, I see two great difficulties of life that are revealed there. Difficulty number one is waiting. I got to tell you, I had a hard time waiting. You know what I did the first two weeks after my surgery? Sat. <laughs> um, sometimes I sat and thought, and sometimes I sat and read, and sometimes I just sat. And it was hard. I was waiting so that I could get not have to have my leg elevated high. Oh, waiting is so hard to do. And the second thing, hard thing in life is communication barriers. Boy, do I see communication barriers everywhere I look. I see it in marriages. I see it in family life between parents and teenagers or parents and teens or kids. Um, I see it in politics. Oh, do I see it in politics. Communication barriers are everywhere we look. Well, waiting, Jesus said to the disciples in Acts chapter 1, wait wait for the gift was after the ascension was 40 days after the i mean excuse me it was after it was um before the ascension but it was after the resurrection and and jesus was meeting with his disciples and he said wait here wait here in jerusalem wait for the gift that i am going to give you now there's three kinds of waiting first of all there's i'm going to call it mindless waiting okay idle waiting um have you ever just sat? Um, nothing to do, nothing occupying your mind. You just sit and wait, just idle waiting. Somebody asks you, what are you doing? Nothing. And that's exactly the truth. You're doing nothing. Idle waiting. The second kind of waiting is predetermined outcome waiting. I'm waiting on something to happen the way I want it to happen. I have a plan. I have a script. Um, I have my life all weighed out, laid out, and I'm waiting for things to happen according to what I want done. I might pray a little bit during my waiting, but I'm predetermined outcome praying. Lord, this is what you need to be doing for me. Okay? And the third kind of waiting is the biblical waiting. Kava is the Greek word, and it means to eagerly, excuse me, that's actually a Hebrew word. It comes from the Old Testament. It means to eagerly wait with a positive hope and expectation, to wait and trust, to wait and believe, to believe that what is coming is going to be a good thing from God, okay? God directed to wait with anticipation, to wait with eager expectation and hope. When the Bible uses the word wait, that's the word the Bible uses. We see it in the Old Testament, kava, in Isaiah 40, 31. They that wait, kava. They that wait with hopeful expectation on the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint or fall. That's waiting with expectation on God to move in my life. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 4, um, it's the same, it's equivalent in the Greek, uh, primino. And it means it's present, active, infinitive, okay? Well, present, we know that Jesus was saying, right now, wait. Active, 
because that is an activity. Um, waiting is not an idleness. It is an active thing when you understand it in a biblical sense. And it's an infinitive, and the infinitive carries the idea of trusting or believing that God is moving, that God is at work. The second problem, difficulty in life, is communication barriers. Oh, how communication barriers haunt us sometimes. Now, there are three kinds of communication barriers. There's language differences. The people in Acts chapter 2 were from every nation, and it lists out the nations that they were from, and every one of them spoke a different language. Um, there are hearing and meaning interpretations. We run into that all the time. Men and women, husbands and wives, you run into that all the time when you say something and your spouse doesn't completely take it the way you said it, okay? There's, there's what I said and what I thought I said. There's what you heard and what you thought you heard. Have you ever found yourself saying to your spouse, I didn't say that. Or how about this? Well, I didn't mean that. Okay, those are communication barriers. There's a third. And the third is that we speak out of languages of circumstances. What do I mean by that? Well, I have a doctor's appointment tomorrow. And one of my concerns with my doctor, and I always have to make sure that he's speaking my language and not his language. Because doctors have a language. They know words that we not only don't know, we can't pronounce and we can't spell okay i'd look it up if i even knew how to spell it and see what it meant but but doctors have their own, lawyers have their own language preachers have their own language we use words atonement eschatology propitiation and the people that grew up in the king james um, know those words but Today, people struggle with a lot of that. Christians have their own language. Born again, saved. Saved from what? Okay. Born again. Um, that was even troublesome to Nicodemus. Christians have their own languages. There's the languages of circumstances, like love languages. Has, have any of you been through the love languages seminars? Okay. And we, we speak with love languages. There are certain things that minister to us, languages that we understand better than others. But it's even beyond that. Because whatever the circumstances are in our life, sometimes troubling circumstances or sometimes joyous circumstances, we filter what we say through those, through those circumstances and we speak a different language. Years ago, years ago when I was young and slimmer, <laughs> um, I was uh, a rollerblader. I used to blade... Um, about 25 miles a day, speed blade, about 25 miles a day. And I had a goal when I was younger that I wanted to rollerblade from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean. Oh, I had different um, um, rollerblade um, sets. I had different uh, wheels. I had different um, bearings that I would put in them depending on the turf. Um, different wheels that would even allow me sometimes to go on, on dirt or rough terrain. I was into it, and, and I was a whole lot lighter, although not so much anymore, um, but, but um, lighter than I used to be, okay? And you know what? Rollerbladers. Um, I would sometimes be out blading, and there would be a kid sitting on somewhere, and I would just sit down next to him, and we would talk a language because rollerbladers have a language, and and we we could identify with each other and talk and use those words. And anybody sitting there would say, what on earth are they talking about? We talk languages of our circumstances. We speak and we hear out of our filters, out of our events, our struggles, our pains, and our experiences of life. So who had gathered in Jerusalem that day? Well, First of all, first of all, let me say this. There were three times when the Old Testament law required Jewish men to be in Jerusalem. In short, it was Passover, Pentecost, and this is Pentecost, and Atonement, or, or um, Feast of, of Booths, okay, in the fall. So two times in the spring, once in the fall. So we are at the Feast of, of Pentecost, and men were required, Jewish men were required to be in Jerusalem for this feast for this high holy day 
And that's why we see people from all of these nations that had gathered there in Jerusalem. They had gathered in obedience to the word of God. Well, we, we read a list, and I'm going to give you the entire list, but I want you to think about this. There were people that were, they were Parthians. Do you know what the word Parthian means, outcast? So somebody said to you, where are you from? I'm from Parthia. But you were saying, I'm an outcast. Just a thought. There were Elamites. The word Elamite means those facing eternity or those dying. There were people from Cappadocia in Pontus. Now, my Bible says Cappadocia common Pontus. The King James says Cappadocia in Pontus. Cappadocia is in Pontus. Okay, and, and so it probably should be translated that way. Cappadocia means horses in this, and, and Pontus means sea. And so, so if you're from Cappadocia in Pontus, you're from horses in the sea. Well, that's kind of a good thing in a bad place. It kind of reminds me of Exodus and the horses of Pharaoh cast into the sea and judgment being poured. There were people that day who felt that they were under the judging hand of God. People from Phrygia means infertile or unproductive or useless. There were people that day that felt useless. There were people from Pamphylia. Pamphylia is a name that means destroyed by fire. Maybe people felt like their whole life had been destroyed. There were people from Libya. Libya means afflicted and weeping. That's still a good understanding of Libya today, folks. There were people who were, who were afflicted. There were people suffering from... Um, end-stage arthritis and cancer and all kinds of other medical problems and people that wept because life was so hurtful to them. There were people from Cyrene. Remember Simon from Cyrene? Cyrene means bondage or walled in or trapped. There were people that day that felt trapped. There were Cretans. You gotta like the Cretans. Now, now this is not a definition of the word Cretan, but Paul writes to Titus in the book of Titus, who is a pastor on the island of Crete. And Paul says these people are vulgar and insensitive. Yeah, in Jerusalem that day there were the vulgar, and there were the, were the insensitive. You see, every one of those people were about to be blessed by God. Every one of these people was about to have an encounter with the Holy Spirit. Every one of these people was about to see God move as they had never, ever saw God move before. And God was going to speak their language, was going to minister to them where they are, was going to speak to them in their circumstances of life. And so I'd like you to stand together with me and let's read our scripture from Acts 1 and then in Acts 2. In Acts 1, verses 1 to 4a, and it says, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day, the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God on one occasion while he was eating with them he gave this instruction, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift that my father has promised. And then in chapter 2, verses 1 to 6, it says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire or languages of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this, they, th this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Pray with me, Heavenly Father. As we come into the holiness of the God-breathed word. Speak to us in our language today. Let us know, Lord, that 
You want to minister to us. You want to move in us. You want to transform us. You want to speak to us. And you're willing to do it in the language in which we speak. Bless our time in the Word today. Anoint this time. Holy Spirit, move in our presence, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. So who was it that had gathered in Jerusalem that day? What language did they speak? Well, I'm going to tell you right now that in a figurative sense, I was in Jerusalem that day. And I was speaking my language that day. And God speaks your language. Isn't it nice to know that God speaks your language? You know, we're privileged. I talked to Stephen Curry, one of the missionaries that we support with Wycliffe. He's going to be here to speak to us at the end of of uh, December and share what God is doing and where God is leading them at that time. Wycliffe Bible translators providing the scripture and the languages of the people. And when we think languages, we tend to just think dialects. We, when we think communication, we think language, English. English is not only my main language, it's my only language, okay? Some of you know Spanish. But God speaks beyond that. He speaks in our heart language. Who was there that day? And what language were they speaking? And how did the Holy Spirit transform people for his glory that day? Well, I want you to know as I think about this, there were those like Peter who spoke the language of pain. Do you, do you have you ever thought about this? Peter spoke the language of pain. It says in John 21, 18, I tell you the truth, Peter, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you don't want to go. Now, it was after the resurrection. It was by the Sea of Galilee. Remember, Peter and the disciples had decided to go fishing because Peter, whenever there was idleness of time, fishing was his default activity. And so they'd fished all night and caught nothing. And suddenly Jesus was there on the shore with fish cooking for their breakfast. And when they came to shore, Jesus spoke to them. And one of the things he said was, Peter, you know, it's the passage, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you three times. But then Jesus said to Peter, when you were young, you know, you were like a youth. You jumped out of bed in, this morning and in, the, in the morning and you got dressed and you went wherever you wanted and you did whatever you wanted, but one day you're going to be old and things are going to change. And someone else will care for you. And someone else will lead you. Someone else will have to help you into your chair for preaching and take your cane. Things change when you get old. Jesus told Peter, your old age is not going to bring good things. Now, if you're approaching old age, I don't want you to go away and say, Pastor Russell said, oh man, old age is miserable. No, 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 that's what I'm saying. But things change, folks. Things change when you get older. And for Peter, they were going to change, and they were going to drastically change. And Peter's old age was going to be a time of martyrdom. Peter would be crucified, and by his own request, upside down, not feeling worthy to die as his Lord had died. This is a world of pain, folks. Many people in life experience pain, and many people speak out of a life of pain. Some of the pain is physical, and some of the pain is emotional, and some of the pain is, is mental. Some of the pain comes from inside of us out, and some of the pain comes from outside into us. You see, I sometimes wonder, wait a minute, doesn't God owe me something better than this? I signed up to be a Christian, God. I thought when he became a Christian, everything was supposed to be good. By the way, show me that verse. It does say in... Romans, that all things we know, that all things work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That's a big difference from saying everything will be good for you. No, no. But I signed up to be a Christian. After all, I'm his child, and shouldn't a father take good care of me as a son? But the Bible doesn't promise that everything's going to be grand, peachy keen. No. I think about Joseph in the Old Testament. 
guys remember Joseph in the Old Testament? Joseph was thrown into a pit, sold to a caravan of tra tra traders that were on their way down to Egypt, got sold as a slave, rose up in Pharaoh's household, and then, I didn't even think about this till yesterday. I was sitting meditating on my sermon. Do you know what happened to Joseph? A woman came along and accused him of something he didn't do. And everybody believed her and nobody believed him. Now that never happens anymore. <laughs> but nobody would believe him. And everybody forgot about him. And there he was in prison. Yeah, life wasn't so grand for Joseph, was it? What about Stephen in the New Testament? In the book of Acts, Stephen became a deacon. And what did he do? He took care of the elderly. He took care of the widows. He served meals to hungry people and preached the word. And they didn't like him. And they stoned him to death. Yeah, you see, the Bible doesn't promise that things are going to be grand for us just because we become a believer. People struggling with soul pain had gathered in Jerusalem that day, folks. And the Holy Spirit was about to transform their life. Is pain the language you speak today? Wait for the gift because the Holy Spirit has a gift for you. Now, next week, we're going to look at what a transformed life looks like. But wait on the Lord. And remember, waiting means trusting. Because the Holy Spirit is going to speak to you in your language of pain. And then there were those like Peter that spoke the language of uncertainty. After Jesus told Peter that one day he would know much pain, Peter looked around and he said, what about him? Pointing to John. Lord, what about John? If that's the way I'm going to be in my old age, what about him? Life is filled with so many questions. So many uncertainties. I question things like, why do bad things happen to good people? A Jewish rabbi many years ago wrote a very good book on that subject. But we wonder that to this very day. Why do good things, bad things happen to good people? Why do the wicked prosper? That's what the psalmist wrote. For I was envious of the arrogance as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. I think that psalm... 73 or 78, one of those. The psalmist even wonders, hey, God, I belong to you, but everybody else is doing better. Why? Why do the wicked prosper? Why do the good die young? One of the saddest episodes, I think, in the Old Testament is Josiah, who became king of Israel, uh, king of um, Israel, um, of uh, Judah, the southern empire, uh, toward the end of its time. Now, in, five, in 605 B.C., the Babylonians invaded and began carrying the people off into captivity. That ended in 586. But one of the last kings, as a matter of fact, there was a series of bad kings for Judah. And then a good king rises to the throne. Guess what? He's eight years old. And we look at that and think, whoa, appointing an eight-year-old king. Now, he wasn't appointed, but a, an eight-year-old guy becoming king? He could be king for like... 60 years, 70 years. And he was a good king. And as a boy, he was taught right, and he loved the word. He loved the word of God, and he taught people the word of God. And he instructed the priests, start acting like God says priests should act. And he reformed his nation. And then he died young. Young, 39 years old. And a wicked king followed him. And I wonder, but God, everything was going so good. Why did you do that? Why did the good die young? And people filled with uncertainty and doubts had gathered in the Jerusalem streets that day. And they had questions about their own life. Questions about their own circumstances. Questions about their own faith. Questions about God and what was God doing and the Romans, and the oppression, and the struggle. And sometimes we're wondering, God, why have you given me an unsaved spouse? 
Why do I have a child that won't walk with you, Jesus? Why am I experiencing that? Why have I lost my job? Why is my finances such a struggle? And then I look at people living in sin. And they're doing so well. We wonder, what are you up to, God? And our lives are filled with uncertainty. Is uncertainty or questioning the language you speak today? Wait for the gift. God wants to meet you in your language and give you assurance and give you victory and empower you and transform your life. I just want to say this, no matter what your language, sometimes we teach as churches, people need to change first. No, 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 no. God speaks to you in your language, whatever it is, and he brings the transformation. There were those like Peter that spoke the language of discouragement. I love Acts 1.6. Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Are we still on that subject? That's what I said if I was Jesus. Is that what we're still doing? You guys are still talking about that? I do. But Peter said, Lord, it's now the time. You're going to defeat Rome. Jerusalem will rise to the top. You're going to become the king. We're going to be a great nation. And you'll rule the whole earth. Is this the start of the millennial kingdom? That's really what the question was. Now, it wasn't necessarily Peter that asked that question, but I'm using Peter as my disciple for all of these things, okay? Because we've been studying Peter. But basically it was, Lord, are we going to take over the world now? Is this when everything is going to be made good again? Are you going to fill, fulfill your promises now, finally? We've been waiting since Cana of Galilee and the water to wine. Is this now finally that you died? You're alive. You can do anything. Is this the time of your kingdom? And the answer was no. All along, the disciples had looked forward to a kingdom that is yet future, folks, even for us. Is there a millennial kingdom? You bet there is. Is it coming? Yes, it is. Is it going to last a thousand years? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. One thousand years of Jesus ruling physically on this earth. And we are going to be there ruling with him. Yes, you. If you are in Christ Jesus, we will be there. But oh, the discouragement for Peter and the disciples. They were looking forward to something far better than Rome had to offer, something far better than Israel had to offer, something far better than this world had to offer. Are you looking for something far better? Are you looking forward to a better day? Isn't this what you signed up for when you became a believer? No. Is discouragement your language? Are you discouraged today? Are discouraged with the way things are going, with what's happening to you, with what's happening in this world, with what's happening in our nation. I don't know about you, but I can't turn on my TV without being discouraged today. I keep wondering, what on earth is wrong with me? Well, there you have the answer. Because my world is not this home. Uh, a new world is my home, a new heaven and a new earth. But if you're discouraged today, the Holy Spirit wants to speak to you in your language. Wait, trust. He will bring transformation to your life. There were those like Peter that day that were impatient walking the streets of Jerusalem. Acts 1-4, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait. Verse 7, Acts 1-7, it's not for you to know the times or the dates. When the question was, is this the time? Jesus said, it's not for you to know that. I want to know that. I want to know everything. I want to know when things are going to get better. I want to know when Jesus is coming again. I want to know when the new heaven and the new earth is going to be. I want to know when the millennial kingdom is going to be set up. I want to know the future. And I want it. 
and I want it now. And I'm impatient for it. I'm not a patient person at all, I have to confess. There's a lot of things in life I want to know. I want to know when is Jesus coming back. I want to know why on earth is it taking so long. I want to know why I have to live with so many issues and so many problems. I want to know why I have to live in a world filled with so much hate. I used to always think the people that would say, you know what we need is a group hug. We're weird. You know what we need is a group hug? <laughs> Not, that won't solve the problem. Second Peter 3, 9, the Lord isn't slow in keeping his promise. As some understand slowness, instead he's patient with you. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You see, if you speak the language of impatience, the Lord is patient with you. Yet even those who were impatient with God walked the streets that day. Do you speak that language? The Holy Spirit wants to speak to your heart and soul. He wants you to wait for the gift that he is going to pour out upon you and transform your impatience to trust. And there were those like Peter who spoke the language of weakness. Acts 1.8 but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Remember that Jerusalem, the holy city, the capital city, was in Judea. So not just within the walls of Jerusalem, but the Holy Spirit was going to come on these men and women, there were 120 of them in all, and fill them with Holy Spirit power, Holy Spirit enabling. And they were going to be witnesses in the nation of Judea, but they were going to be witnesses up north in Samaria. They hated the Samaritans. They were half-breeds, Jews that had married Gentiles. And then from Samaria, they were going to go to the ends of the earth, you see, in ancient times in Jesus' day, Galilee was thought of the end, as the ends of the earth. And it was just the beginning of the end, but and regions beyond. Jesus said, wait, wait, you are weak right now, but you are going to become empowered, enabled with the Holy Spirit in you. You see, Jesus knew that in the flesh, in the natural man, even after three years of training, Every one of them, the 11 disciples that were there, the substitute disciple that was also there, and the rest of the 120, men and women among them, they lacked power. They lacked power for life, and they lacked power for ministry. You see, in the future, they were going to need the empowering of the Holy Spirit. They were going to need the strengthening of the Holy Spirit, the enabling of the Holy Spirit. Two things they were going to face that were going to be really tough. Number one, they were going to have to face death. And for many of them, it was going to be a cruel death. And the Holy Spirit was going to enable them, like Stephen, like Peter, like Paul, to be strong in that day when they would become martyrs for the sake of Jesus. But you know what's harder? You know what's harder than facing death? Facing life. Facing life. And the pains and the weaknesses and the struggles and the ailments and the conflicts. And the Holy Spirit was going to enable them. And the Holy Spirit enables us. Makes us strong in our weakness. Weakness manifests itself in so many ways. Lack of confidence, feelings of inadequacy, fear of involvement. And so weakness often results in us withdrawing, isolating ourselves feeling dejected, feeling depressed. Some of us speak that language today. The weak walked the streets that day of Jerusalem. Do you speak the language of weakness? The Holy Spirit has a gift of enabling for you. Trust. Wait. 
It's coming. And then there were those who spoke, like Peter, the language of fear. Acts 1.9. Acts 1.9 is just, to me, it's one of the funniest scenes in all of the Bible. In Acts chapter 1, verse 9, we have the ascension of Jesus. Let me read it. After he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. So there's Jesus, standing with the disciples, the twelve and others. And while Jesus is in their presence, in their presence, folks, no strings attached. All of a sudden, Jesus ascends. Well, what are you going to do? You're going to watch. And then he disappeared in the clouds. Have you ever watched an airplane take off? Maybe a loved one was leaving. And you watch that plane go, and then it gets to the point where it goes into the clouds, but you stand there watching still, thinking, maybe I'll catch a glimpse again in the break in the clouds. And there they stood. Probably their mouths dropped open, right? When, when I look straight up, my mouth drops open. It, I don't know, it's something about my jaw is attached to my neck muscle. They just stood there looking up. And an angel came along. And said, uh, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? What are you doing? Jesus gave you an instruction. But you know what? I have to think that for a moment they were afraid, folks. A hidden Jesus? Wouldn't the Christian life be so much better, easier, more delightful if Jesus were present right here in our midst, we could look at him and touch him? Well, he is present right here in our midst. We just can't see him with these earthly eyes. And there's many times in my life, how about yours, when I feel like Jesus is hidden from me? Where are you, Lord? Where are you, Lord? I see devastating events in the world, earthquakes and hurricanes and tornadoes and tsunamis. And I wonder, where are you, Jesus? Sometimes Jesus appears to be hidden. We find ourselves afraid and alone and feeling abandoned and forsaken and friendless. And fear is a very, very powerful emotion. Fear of the future. Fear of death. By the way, if you have a fear of the future or a fear of death, you're not unchristian and you're not abnormal. We all fear the unknown. See, I don't fear everlasting life, but I have a little bit of fear about getting there. Fear of eternity, fear of judgment. I don't have a fear of eternity and I don't have a fear of judgment. Some people have a fear of reward. I don't have a fear of reward. And I'm looking forward to that. If that's your language, whether real or imagined. Wait. Wait on the Lord. Trust. Because we have a friend that sticks closer than a brother. My oldest son called me yesterday morning. Before the 7 o'clock hour. Now, I don't sleep with my phone. And so, it's Saturday morning. And usually, the only guy that calls me early in the morning is you, Ben. <laughs> so, I'm thinking, can't be Ben. Even Ben doesn't call me this early. <laughs> well, I went and got my phone. And it takes me a while. And I saw it was my son. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, the first emotion that went through my heart was fear. My son has five kids. I call him back right away. He said, Dad, the ambulance just picked up Rebecca. That's one of my granddaughters. How old is she, Joy? 16. I knew she was a teenager. 16. She just passed out. 
She was up, it's home, it was homecoming uh, weekend up there in, in Wisconsin. And I could hear it in his voice. He was scared. The ambulance actually was still there. And I prayed. He didn't ask me to pray. But later he told me, he said, you know, I, I called you because I knew you'd pray. And I'm glad to report she's doing fine. Um, not sure exactly what caused it. We're going to do some testing, but it kind of seems like it maybe was an anomaly. You know what? In our fear, all we can do, and we speak the language of fear often, trust. Wait on the Lord. Fear-filled people walked the streets of Jerusalem that day. Do you speak that language? The Holy Spirit has a gift for you. I think this is the last one. I didn't number them. I can't remember. And I had to cut some out because I knew my sermon was getting way too long. But there were those like Peter who spoke the language of confusion. And there he was, standing there looking into the sky, confused. Where do we go? What do we do? Now, I think the angel that came and said, this same Jesus who has been taken from you in heaven will come back in the same way that you have seen him go. Was sort of a message he's coming back. Now, get busy doing what he said to do. Because I think that the angel probably knew that Peter's default was go fishing. <laughs> what else is there? Confusion. What do we do? I know, I know from talking to people in the congregation that there are several of you without employment or good employment right now. And life is confusing for you. Others of you are dealing with struggles in life, issues, matters. And life is confusing for you. And suddenly, Peter and the others felt lost and confused and shepherdless, leaderless. Their immediate problem was that they weren't doing what Jesus told them to do. Jesus told them to wait. And sometimes Jesus tells us to wait. And our initial response is, I don't want to wait. I want to do something. Waiting is doing something. When you understand the definition I used at the beginning, that it's trust that is Actively looking forward to what God has in God's time. When we fail to obey the word of God, we too find ourselves lost and confused. Do you speak the language of the lost? I don't mean the lost in your salvation. The wandering and the confused. Is that your language? Wait for the gift that the Holy Spirit has, and the Holy Spirit has a gift for you. And so let me conclude. The crowd that day, the streets of Jerusalem were filled. A couple hundred thousand people had gathered from all over the empire, every one of them speaking their own language, not only their own dialect, but their own heart language. The young were there, and the old. And the young and the old don't speak the same language, do they? The wise were there and the simple-minded. The professional and the common. The sweet and the sour. The critical and the content. The depressed and the invigorated, the indifferent, and the responsive. Did I get your language? I was there. Were you? I walked those streets. I speak a lot of those languages. Some days I speak them more than other days. Some days I speak one of them, and another day I speak a different one. But I've spoken all of those languages. And the Lord wants to speak to us in our language. The Lord is not knocking on your door saying, 
just get over it and then we can talk. The Lord is saying, I'm going to speak to you in your language. I'm going to show you a wonderful gift that I have for you. I was there in all my weakness, in all my frailty, in all my humanity. I was there. You have to become something different for the Holy Spirit to lay hold of your life. You just have to be you, folks. You just have to be you. Jesus isn't particularly impressed with the super spiritual. But he reaches out to the super honest. You just have to be silent. And wait. And listen for his voice. And what happened this day on the streets of Jerusalem where people stopped, people stopped, and they listened. And they said, how is this? We are hearing in our own language. Sometimes in life, folks, we need to stop. I have a men's retreat coming up I'm going to be a speaker at. One of the things I'm going to talk to the guys about is learning to be silent, in the presence of God. You see, it's really hard to hear when we're doing all the talking. I think about that often when I watch um, the 24-hour news broadcasts. And, you know, we're going to bring in a couple of experts, one on either side of the issue. And then they spend the whole time just speaking over each other. And I can't tell what either one of them said, neither can they. Sometimes we do that to the Holy Spirit. And we're so busy in our prayer life telling him what he needs to do to be God. And the Holy Spirit, because my mom told me that I'm never allowed to use the word shut up, says to you and to me, silent. Be silent. Listen. Wait. Trust trust Psalm 25 5 give me guide me in your truth and teach me for my trust is in you all day long it says in the King James for all day long I wait upon you waiting is trusting that God is at work Psalm 27 14 wait on the Lord trust the Lord and he will strengthen you in your weary heart. Peter and the rest of the 12 and the 120 waited. And God moved. And the Holy Spirit visited. And transformation happened. And empowerment fell upon them. And they became a new people with a new language what language do you speak today in that language if you will be silent and wait and trust the holy spirit will be transformation to you next week we're going to look at what that transformation does pray with me heavenly father